had a not not a not an appearance. But he had a it's not as raw. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I mean it's not as raw. It's like it's like having a knee game Oh, the grant. How would that be? Well it is a fa it's supposed to be a family show. Well, but I mean the language you might could. But but still, I like the raw. I, I like See that. like if you go to if you go to country music, Hank Williams Jr. never conformed to the well, commercialized. Right. And and he stayed good. Mm -hmm. Neither did Waylon Jennings. But then you take some of these other new artists, they get to where they're going with the flow and what they tell people they like. And all of a sudden they start playing out. I mean, who, who, who would who would have who would have been an artist that would have stayed raw? Uh, R.I.P. D.M.X. He stayed raw. Uh, he stayed raw. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but because from an artist standpoint, I think you know as time goes by, yeah. Uh, you want to explore different things. You want to explore different audiences. And as an artist, as a as an artist, so yep. so many times we we come out a certain way. People want to put us in a box. Okay, he's he's a gangster rapper from Charlotte. He's got to be in street clothes and doing his thing. Of what about involvement? We don't want to stay the same all the time. We want to evolve. Why 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 not stay the same? I mean, what's evolved? I mean, why even evolve? Why get, not just stay with what you do? Get better. At what? What you do? Perform performing. Yeah. Reaching different audiences. I because like that that particular uh, the baby um, performance in question. Mm -hmm. As a the baby fan from the back from his early beginnings, I liked it, and then now he might reach a different audience that otherwise wouldn't be engaged because. Uh, uh, preconceived notions when they see a, a, a rapper in a hoodie or a, a jersey, they see a rapper in a suit, and they might stick around for the performance. So now he has his, his base audience and a new audience. So it's about the money. Uh, if, to reach new audiences, it'd be, have to be about the money. That's why you do it for the money. If you just did it for the love, you would just drop music, put it on up streaming platforms and never promote it if it was just for the love and if you got money from it you got money from it but you wouldn't have a strenuous tour schedule and all of this stuff if it wasn't for the money so it's, so all, it's about, all about the folding of the dollars as, you, as the old timers used to say it's about the folding it's, of the it's part of it it's part of it you know I, I think you know with any profession when you get to a certain height it becomes a lot of business and some of the the raw love of the creativity gets taken out of it and, and you become a little bit more business orientated. Let's take Hank Williams Jr. Let's say if he had changed and tried to increase his audience by playing different music, it wouldn't have worked. I mean, so what about, what about when, we say, when we see Hank Williams uh, performing with Lil Wayne? Isn't that going to a different audience and doing something different? If that would work. <laughs> but he did it. That, oh, that's he did what I'm saying. Sure he did it. Yeah, so that's an artist that's been in that lane for so long. That's why people in do, a certain time. That's why doing, people do duets. They get one artist singing with another artist, and it brings both their audiences in. They say, oh, I, I like that guy too. I'll, I'll, I guess that's the reason. I think for longevity as an artist, you got to be able to switch things up and evolve with the times if you want to continue to uh, be prosperous when it comes to uh, making a living off of being an artist. Because if you couldn't do that, you'd have to quit being an artist. Yeah, right? you would, you it would get boring, you know. We, we uh, Human attention span, even something that's super great, sometimes we don't appreciate it until it's gone. And uh, something, you know... I think that's why most of the artists that last over generations is because they had different grooves and were able to be timeless and evolve with the times.
such as Madonna, maybe. Madonna. Cher. Cher. Cher changed. Bee Gees. Bee Gees. Uh, Bee Gees, maybe the most. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really evolved and went with the times. So I guess you're right. I wish my girlfriend would say that more often. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dwight, tell us about the Grand Fondo. Grand Fondo. What did you do in preparation? You, you, you wrote, did you do the whole thing? Yes, sir. How did you, what number did you come in? I came in 62 out of 488, 95-mile riders that were riding that 95-mile. Did you start out at Finley State, uh, Finley Stadium? No, sir. Where did they start out at? We started out uh, around the Bessie Smith Cultural Center on MLK mm -hmm. downtown. It was a whole line. I was in corral number nine, and it was about... 13 crowds. Why do you crowd. why do you do that? The reason why I do that is because I love the the um, just the the excitement of cycling. Um, the passion I have for what I love it is you know the thrill of competition. Um, you know being out in the wind, being out in the air with everybody. You know, just you know, leaving nothing, leaving nothing. There's nothing. I've ridden those. When you right. get back, I, I've done the three state, three mountain ride, right. I which I well. and that was um, I did it like four years in a row. Correct. Did you do Burke Holter and the whole nine yards? I, I did. Uh, I also did the. I did the one 2017. I did the one 2018. And then of course you know they stopped. They, I did it the four years before they stopped. Right. Yeah. I mean, I did it all, all straight years in a row, but I did it those number of times. And then, of course, you know, it stopped because of COVID. Well, actually, actually it stopped. It stopped it before. Yeah, why it was stopped. that it stopped? It actually stopped before the COVID situation last year. Uh, it was the year before they stopped. It was the year before that. You know, what one, was the reason? I mean, one, one, one of the counties didn't want to deal with That's what it was, yeah. Because it's anymore. three state, three mountain. Right. They, you know, I'm, did uh, you make it up Burke Holter every time? Oh, yes, I did. Boy, it was rough. Golly. You know? Yes, yes. Did they yeah. run the cowbell? Run the cowbell, all that. And then, but thank God no one. Thank God. Nobody's I, watching. Well, no, thank God I wasn't out there when someone, when people were throwing tax and stuff on the on the street and things like that. Because in a certain area of the county, they didn't want the riders coming through. Well, I, don't, I don't know if I'm really. Let me tell you about what happened. Which to, one it was, but. <laughs> let me tell you what happened to me. I, I rode, got all the way to Burkhalter, mm -hmm. got to the SAG there. I had that SAG there. And I started, this girl took off. Well, I just took off behind her. And somebody in the back hollered for her. And she turned around and went back. I kept going. Well, I was going the wrong way. Mm. <laughs> I went nine miles out of the way. Because it was an old, you know, they had the arrows. And I was following the arrows from a previous race. Right. And that's why they were hollering for her to come back. Right. And I went, so, anyway. Boy. But, boy, that is, you know, until you've done that, you just have no idea how hard that is. Right, right. Oh, you know, right. The cycling races are hard anyway. Thank, thank God that you have races like the one yesterday that was very, very, very organized. I will say it was very organized. Uh, the hand capital race was very, very well organized. You know, I was even a little nervous myself, but I'm just be honest. But uh, very well organized, many arrows, uh, cycling, uh, marshal uh, for all of the races, all of the, 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 the lower level race, the second level race, and then the third level race, which was the highest, 95 miles. Uh, you know, these marshals are riding before us. I mean, these guys are good. I mean, like, oh, hold on. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the 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 handicappy guy. Well, he would he would there be people there that's riding that can ride better than him? Oh, now yeah. that they're younger. Oh yeah. And yeah. he's older. Oh yeah. Uh, 
uh, you know, George Hincap has been doing it for many years. Of course, he's the founder, president, CEO, founder of the organization, uh, Hincap, Hincap Races. Uh, being a person that is very experienced at riding, uh, his, you know, his entourage and his guys came in. They didn't come in last yesterday, but they came in uh, probably maybe 30 or 40 riders before the final riders came in. But, you know, they were, but, you know, they were running videos, too. And Almost stuff. escort. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they had videos. Did you videos. ride with somebody or by yourself? Oh, I rode by myself. Did you try to draft or does that, I always uh, feel funny about drafting behind people that, the that I don't know. Riding the peloton and all that. No, nah, no, not really. Um, I didn't have a team to ride with, but, uh, you know, it is good. You know, at the beginning when you're riding, of course, everybody's going to ride together and everybody is really expected to yeah. really understand the rules of the road and be smart about it and don't do anything crazy and don't make yeah. no sharp left or right turns and stoppages and stuff like that. Because if you do, you got someone right behind you mm. that's going to collide with you. Bam, it's going to be over for that particular one or two or three individuals, whatever. But uh, luckily, I'm glad that didn't happen yesterday either. But uh, no, I didn't ride with them. Did y'all go up? But you, did, was Burkholter in the in the that Burkholter Mountain? Was that in the? No, 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 no. I was. Um, Do you have any steep decline or steep declines? Oh yes, yes, most definitely. You know. Uh, How fast would you say you got yesterday? That that deep decline. Um, that steep decline, I would say maybe 20, 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour or something. But I'm telling you, the, the second run was scary. Uh, the, when you when I'm when we began to go through the Red Bank Tunnel and come down uh, the sand and come into the area of Red Bank, in the, in the Red Bank entrance, uh, where it says welcome to Red Bank, and then we turn left and go headed towards down Signal Mountain Road. And then head towards like um, Baylor, uh, where we turn left, we go on Pineville. Oh my goodness, that is the Long. and look, it's early in the morning time. Yeah, you look, just I had no breakfast. No, a little chilly. I had no breakfast, and it was yeah. chilly yesterday yeah. morning too. I'm looking like, hey, you ever get in those lines and you're looking over at uh, somebody that looks like? that you could beat up <laughs> and they're smoking you on the side. You ever experience oh, that? Yeah. You think, how does this person do that? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, what yeah. are they doing? Most definitely. I mean, them guys, you know, some of them have been doing it for years. Some of them have been more well prepared. Uh, I'm very prepared myself, but yes, I do look over to the, to the right, to the left and say, man, these, how, they, know, how they do it, you know? <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's all about just going with you no, and just not being scared. Have you noticed that some people that are even even heavy, that has nothing to do with cycling. They can be heavy, they can be skinny, they can be strong, they can be not be strong, and you can't tell how good of a rider they're going to be by looking right. at them. You're right. That means nothing. You're so right about that. You, I mean, you, typically you can kind of say, oh, he'd be a good rider, but you never know. Right. So, you know, I think you just got to, you know, a lot of it has to do with your core. Of course, a lot of it has to do with your core. You know, your core. Uh, you know, your legs. You know, your calves. All that. And your wind. Uh, my problem your cardio. is cardio. My Brent. My problem is the wind. I get to where I. You know, I run out of breath. Mm -hmm. They say when I ride, I don't breathe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I guess I'm just focusing on. But I, I'm more just a hobbyist rider. Mm -hmm. You know, we did. 30, 33 miles yesterday at 17 miles an hour, and mm -hmm. that's pretty good for East Tennessee. Mm -hmm. That's not bad, is it? No, no, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. I mean, you know, for the most part, your cycling period is always good. But I ride like a, a Trek Amanda, 14 pounds. Very familiar with that. Yeah, and, but I, you have disc brakes? Uh, on, the, on, the bike, on the cycling bike yesterday? Yeah. No, I don't. But I do have bikes with disc brakes on, and those disc brake bikes are much better when you're going downhill like I was yesterday, because I was looking at a steep hill going down. Do you feather it with disc brakes like you would? Yes. No, 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 actually, no, no. 
uh, not really with with uh, mounted brakes. Uh, you just just hold it down and just uh, keep your hands on the trigger, held down, and that's it. Just you go it. down in the drops, or you stay on the hoods? I stay on the hoods. You know, the uh, I feel safer on the hoods, don't you? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. The uh, uh, you know when you feather a little bit, uh, it's kind of a little more dangerous if you ask me. But when I feather it, that that's telling my brain I've got brakes. Right. You know I, I'm right. saying, oh I've got them, I've got them, right. I've got them, right. rather than just saying, okay if I need them I'll. I'll... Right. But, but but the problem is when you feather it, then you are taken away from the actual stoppage and your, you know, you being <coughs> very, very cautionary with uh, not uh, losing yourself when you're breaking. You know, it's kind of like, of course, you know, I'm a chef and I've been chefing for years. So it's kind of like when you are uh, frying something, but you got it in the fryer, but then when you pull it up to check it, well, guess what? You actually slow down the process. You know, yes, you can shake the basket all you want, and that's good, but you still slow down the cooking. Same thing even with sauteing. When you sauteing something on the stove, as I know my profession, and you bring the saute pan off the heat, and you go over and take the saute pan with you, and then grab some ingredients and throw in there, that's taking one. Same thing with sauteing. When you uh, are feathering, I feel that you are taking away from your actual stopping power and also your ability to be able to know that uh, or at least keep yourself uh, in a good standing with uh, uh, not um, not having brakes so to speak so, you know worst thing you want to do is run out of brakes when you're going down the hill yeah. like i was yesterday and it was, and that wasn't very scary, actually. Did you run out of brakes? No, I didn't. Thank God, I did. Did you ever get? Did <laughs> you? Because I, I was here with you today. <laughs> did your hand? Did your hands ever get sore right here? They were actually yes. Because because you're yes. Because my palm. Because my hands were like that, and I was like, Man. I was like, you guys to be joking me. I'm talking about this was a very very steep decline. I had to question my own mind for a quick second there, because seriously, that was a very steep decline. You know, the first year I did it, I got off the bike. It was so steep, and I couldn't get back on the bike because you couldn't get clipped in fast enough to be going down the hill so fast you couldn't control it. So I had to. I walked a ways, and it wore out the bottom of my cleats. But right. if anybody came by, I'd just act like I had a flat tire. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Most definitely. Most definitely. But yeah. is cycling just a hobby, right, for you? No, cycling is a passion, and I hope to be, no, not that I hope to be, but next year I'm going to be at a way, way strong, bigger level. Uh, I had a great opportunity today to talk with some people, team operators. Gave me great opportunities today as I discuss my uh, thoughts and plans, uh, my desires. I had a great opportunity, you know, I had a good opportunity to meet many people that I did yesterday as well as George Hancap, which I've met him before, but I got a chance to talk to him yesterday, actually, pictures with him and everything. Um, and that's, that, that don't always happen. Yeah. You know, with celebrity cyclists. And, you know, he's a good friend with Lance Armstrong, right by his side, that was his main man. You know, helped him in all those many years. But, uh, so I had a great opportunity to meet many different people yesterday. I had a great chance today to talk to so many people as well. Uh, my desire is to uh, go at a much, much higher level. You know, US, the, USA Cycling and UCI Continental. I know, I know you know exactly what those mm -hmm. are. Uh, races sponsored by professionals and, and, and big league cycling events. What would you have averaged yesterday? Time? Did you did you stop at the sag? Uh, no, I didn't actually. Uh, you just kept rolling. I kept rolling, I kept rolling. I mean, I, I did stop for a moment, uh, but it wasn't really, really long at all. Twice? One time. I, I just want to keep on going. Uh, so 95 miles, you stopped one time? So one time. To pee, I guess, right? Yeah, and, and you know, really, I mean, you can do, I mean, you can do 10, 15, 20 miles in no time. Yeah, so that's nothing. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm like trying to get on my way, I'm trying to get back as quick as I can, because I know 
uh, I'm gonna be in some kind of placement somewhere, you know, time wise. Well, the thing about it is, if if you if somebody's fifty yards ahead of you, you can't hardly catch them. You can't catch them. Can't catch them. I mean, you know, uh, they've got to stop too, right? You know, I mean, with everybody exactly. With everybody, you know, with everybody. So if I stop, I'm thinking, man, I I'll be in. Ten, I'll be a ten ahead if I don't stop. Right, ten ahead or more. Do you, but you don't think it pays you to stop, take three minute break, get back on the bike. Do you think you'd pass those other people that didn't stop? No, I don't think no. so either. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> you just no. can't stop. Right, I just can't stop. Do, do you do any? Do you eat any, anything while you're riding? Oh yeah. Where you pack? Where you pack? Um, I had I had everything packed behind me. I had man, look, look, I had the whole grocery store packed behind all this junk. No, I didn't. I didn't have the whole store packed behind me. Uh, I had a lot of power bars. I had about three power bars behind me. Goo? You have any uh, goo? I did have goo actually. That makes uh, me nervous. So, do, do no, you? The, the goo is good. Mm -hmm. The goo is good. Uh, the goo chews are good. Uh, I had three power bars behind me. I had about three oatmeal, little Debbie oatmeal. Well, they're good, aren't they? <laughs> you ever drink a little Debbie? Yeah. You ever drink a Coke? You know what? I drank a Coke yesterday after the race. After we, after we all got back, you know, and uh, spent so much time congratulating everybody and having a good time and enjoying everything, the festivities and stuff. It's been kind of like a family time. Yeah. Uh, I got a Coke at the very, very end. After I, well, it was good, you know, isn't it? Great. It was, it was super. You know, after the beer, <laughs> after the beers, after the pizza, after the Papa John pizza yeah. and all that, I had a great time. I, I put a, I mix my water half Coke and half water. Oh. That helps. Oh, mm. it's good. Just half and half. Half and half. Mm hmm. Mm. It's good. <laughs> but is your passion more in cycling? Obviously, it's more in, as a chef, right? Mm hmm. Yes, sir. Where did that come from? I'm glad you asked that question. That passion came many years ago, being around my grandmama years ago when I was a kid. 10, uh, 12? Uh, a little bit younger than that. Uh, I was young. So, I know you enjoy cycling, but your main passion is a chef, obviously. That's what brings the money in. That's right. Where did that come from? I mean, everybody likes to cook. Oh, yeah. The, you know, everybody likes to cook. My passion for cooking came from being around my grandma at an early age uh, when I was young. Um, my grandma loved me uh, like a son, you know, and all my family, of course. My, my granddad was a great person, and my mom. Uh, I, I watched my grandmother in the kitchen cooking all various types of food. No nothing, no bought anything, no pre-made. No, this, this is a scratch cook. <laughs> mm. Grandma was a scratch cook. So she would cook fried chicken. She would uh, make great pasta dishes, make great seafood dishes. Everything she made, she would make great uh Bake dish, you know, make great pies and cakes. Uh, apple turnovers, where you have to take and fill the turnover, you know, and you know, bring, you know, flip, uh, bring, uh, fold the dough over, mash it down with a fork, mm -hmm. fry it. That's grandma. So my grandma gave me that passion. What do you remember about your grandmother cooking? I remember well. I, you know, I can take you to the time when my grandma taught me about the first food that she taught me how to cook. I can but, but I'm talking about the time when you remember the real thing when you saw your grandmother cooking. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily teaching you, mm -hmm. but I mean, I like, like, like my grandmother, I, I, to this day I eat pimento cheese sandwiches, hot pimento cheese sandwich and Pringles. Mm -hmm. Because my grandmother fixed it to, mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. while I was watching Gunsmoke. Mm -hmm. uh, that's good. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and, and so that's 
that's when I relate pimento cheese sandwiches to my grandmother. Right. So, w what was your relation? What did you? What do you relate to? Because there's got to be a connection besides just she taught me to cook. Right. I can relate. I can relate when I cook fried chicken to my grandmama when she cooked it because she would do it the way that people normally don't cook fried chicken, but the way she done it, old school, cooking in a cast iron skillet, you know, in grease, uh, nice and seasoned. Salt, a lot of uh, salt. No, not a lot of salt, but nice and seasoned. Nice and seasoned, you know, you gotta have a balance there. She was always about that balance. Floured up, made sure that was always floured, you know, and coated, and, uh, you know, fried correctly. You know, dropped in a cast iron skillet, uh, not grease flying all over the frying, you know, all over the floor and all that. You know, she had a piece of paper that was put down on the floor because she didn't want her floor full of grease. Mm -hmm. And she also fried fried chicken with a glass top on it. You know, now keep this in mind. This is cast iron skillet. If this is grease mm -hmm. at a certain level in that frying pan with the chicken frying in it and turning it over, which typically you don't have to have no glass, mm -mm. glass lid on it, but she would do that because, you know, the grease all, all over her stove and, and, and all on her floor, that helped to prevent that, that piece of paper, and also that glass skillet. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that glass lid. Now, now, was she doing that because she was cooking, or was all of this necessity? She, you know, she was doing that because she was cooking, all of it wasn't necessarily a necessity, but because my grandmama had her ways, and she was a super, super great cook, chef, and a person, that was just her. And I learned a lot from her, and I thank God for her. She have her, she have other ways besides just cooking, she have her ways about everything? Oh yeah, most definitely, oh yeah. You know, she was the boss, you know, that was her kitchen. You know, you know when when she cooked food, nobody was coming up in her kitchen and bothering stuff. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm gonna tell you the real, real deal. Yeah, I know you like this. When she was baking cakes, could no one enter into her kitchen. You know why? Because in that stove and that, you know the the, the cakes you know that were poured into the molds that were inside, you know, in, in place inside the uh, s stove, to, you know, to bake. Well, the problem is that sometimes if it's too much jarring in the house, too much jarring on the floor, of course, you know, we live with grandma, you know, old school house, yeah. you know. Everybody's old, around. Old, you know, old floors mm -hmm. and stuff. If you got too much jarring coming through the kitchen, that may cause her cake to drop. And if her cake drops, <laughs> Some of them gonna get it. Some of them gonna get it. She didn't like that. Lemon pound cake, German chocolate cake. You're making me hungry. You know. It's that good stuff. I, what did she cook as a rule? What did she cook as a rule? And what do you remember? As a rule, um, as a rule, meatloaf had to be a certain way every time. Had to have the right sauce in it. Had to have the right balance. It wasn't even, and it wasn't no tomato. No, excuse me, it wasn't no ketchup. First of all, yeah. you, don't, you don't put ketchup on no meatloaf in it, okay? <laughs> it's got too much too much high fructose corn syrup in it, too much sugar. It just don't taste right, okay? Uh, it, you know, not really, really tomato sauce. It just, it's got to be blended up right and made right to be to be good, you know? And grandmoms know, uh, you know, many professionals know, many chefs know, like myself, that what they learn from grandmama is good in the right way. How did they learn this? You know, grandma. Think about it. How did they learn this? You know, they, you know, they learned through a lot of trial and error. They learned through a lot of heart, heartaches and you know, try, trial and error, heartaches and and pain. Would that have been the entertainment? I mean, I guess that eating would have been the entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. What else was there? A little bit of radio and some eating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. It's all about it's all about getting together and celebration, you know. Mm. Food food was a way to bring people together. That's what I always, that's what I knew uh, that food was always about. Uh, you know, 
is, uh, you know, food, food, food brings them together. You know, we try to do the South, South, you know, Southern food, soul food. So it's so not it's, all the same. So it's about the food, but it's not about the food. Does that make sense to you? Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's about the food, but it's not about the food. Well, getting together, food brings them together. It's about, it's about the food. Food brings them together. It brings them together. But then it becomes not about the food. It it's about the... Right. It, right. It becomes not about the food. You know, most importantly, it's about uh, connectivity, togetherness. Connectivity and togetherness could be with or without food. But because when you have family there together and you have food, you find your way to connect. It's an excuse. <laughs> right? And somebody oh, said, hey, y'all come over and let's talk. <laughs> Nobody would come. Right. But if you say, hey, let's go come over and eat. Yeah, I, I understand. I understand your point. You know, you know, you should want to be together with family, period. Now, as far as, you know, comfort food, soul food, and southern food, is there a difference? Yes, it is. Soul food is about family, about heritage. Would uh, mine be different than yours, or yours be different than somebody else's? Yes, in a way, yes. But primarily, soul food is about heritage, family. That's soul food, you know, goes way back, goes back. Southern food is about what's typical of the South. Such you as? Know, such as greens and... Pinto beans. Green, corn sweet bread. potatoes, cornbread, things like that. But now, soul food, you take cornbread and you make it water cornbread. That's a difference. <laughs> now, let's back up. Well, no, water water <laughs> now, cornbread and cornbread now, is totally now, different. Now, 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 cornbread is southern. Right. But water corn, water cornbread, hot is, water cornbread is, 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 is heritage. That's that's what. What is water cornbread? Water. Made with water instead of milk. Yes, water cornbread is made with water instead of milk, sugar, uh, cornmeal. All from scratch. All from scratch. You know. Why no milk? Because um, because didn't cause, have any milk. Exactly. Back in the day, you might not have no milk, so you had to 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 make do. In my opinion, soul food comes from what was made out of necessity and and what ingredients were readily available and i mean so like in the in the the days of captivity you was only allotted a certain certain things and you could only get your hands on what you could probably grab out the field so we had to make do with with greens and chitlins and 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 chicken gizzards and then now, which with those things would be considered a southern delicacy, that's soul food. You know, like he's like he was saying, Grandma making the the, the fried chicken in the cast iron skillet, cause you know that's that's what we had readily available. That's that's what makes it soul food. Right, that's powerful. So it's not the it's not this well. It is the ingredients. It is it's it is the ingredients. It's the ingredients. And like you said, it's the heritage. If I try, if I eat water cornbread versus milk cornbread, would I taste the difference? Most deaf. <laughs> what would it be like? Uh, like water uh, cornbread. It's the texture. Um, you mix it all the same. You just don't use milk. Use water. Right. Uh, you know. It's, it's and you gotta you, you gotta get it to a certain lighter. temperature, yeah. and you gotta you have to bake it for a certain time. Too short or too long ain't gonna get it. It's the it's that. And, and, and without any timers and without any of that, grandma and, and, and great-grandma and all, they knew, you know, we, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And then, so that would be soul food. And southern food is just the southern stuff, the, the southern staples. And then comfort food is whatever you eat when, you know, for nostalgia or, or certain times. Like ball game, you got to have the beef chili dog with the, with the relish. You know, or, or Super Bowl, you want your, your chicken wings with your dip, chips mm -hmm. and dip. Yeah. So I think I think that's comfort food, you know, what you think about. But, but I think of comfort food is what you, you grew up on early, early, early. 
I, I, when I think of comfort food, I, I think about what I want at this time. What's going to make me happy, comfortable at this time. So like, like if you was watching the Super Bowl, you'd have uh, uh, Zaxby's hot wings and those celery sticks. Exactly. And if, I'm, uh, if I'm bowling, I want some nachos to make me happy. Yeah. But that's just, that's just my opinion. But it might be different from you. Yeah. Now, this Anthony Bourdain, Bourdain, he had a good idea, didn't he? Anthony, Chef Anthony Bourdain. Bourdain, yeah. He had, he thought that food from, if you went into somebody's place and you ate their food, then that showed them that you were receptive to their opinion. And when you ate with them, you could, you could mesh the opinions to where they were, uh, they were the same, and you could come to a common ground. That's basically his show, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. And the Bourdain. Yeah. And that goes back to your point. Your your point mm -hmm. that it's not about the food. It's that's the excuse. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, or am I crazy? I think I think both things can be. The, uh, the right at the same time. It's about it's about the it's about the meeting, but it's about the food too. Cause like if you pull up to the barbecue, it depends on who's the grill if you're staying or not. You know, we you might just you might that's just right, that's you right. might just pop in and say hey to yeah. everybody, give everybody a hug and leave. Exactly. But the if, barbecue's got to be good. If the right, right uncle is is on right. on the grill, then you're gonna right. stay a while, kick back, and wait on a plate. <laughs> so it's, a, it's about it's right. about the it's about the excuse to get together, but it's about the food at the same time. Right, gotta be especially who's cooking the fried chicken. That makes who all made the, the potato salad. <laughs> that makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, I mean, it really does. Right. I mean, I can't. I, I don't expect to get the same quality fried. Like keep in mind what I'm saying. I cannot expect to get the same quality fried chicken from everyone because I expect it to be quality. I'm not saying that it's got to be perfect from everyone, but it's got to be quality for me to eat it. Because I know if it's too dark and it tastes a certain way it's been there, I'm not going to want it. So that quality, if the quality's not there, it's not going to be edible for me. I'm not even going to enjoy it. Can so, you, can you yeah. go to a fast food restaurant and eat, or does that just drive you crazy? Oh, I can. I can. You know, certain, some fast food restaurants are not really considered fast food anymore, KFC. Know the, the name is uh, they call it casual dining. Yeah, casual, people, dining. casual dining. Casual yeah. dining. Now, they, they, some people say, "Oh, it's fast food," but it's not. It's casual dining. You got to get actually get back there and work with it, and work that uh, food. You got to work with that chicken. I know. Been there, <laughs> done it. Uh, so it, it's it's what you have to do to produce great chicken products. Or let me say, with any food, uh, it takes work to be able to deliver a great product. And if the quality is not there based off of who's cooking it, uh, it's not going to be receptive, or, you know, by anyone. You know, some people, but really it's not going to be receptive by anyone because they, you know, uh, they, you know, they should be able to tell. How yeah. did you go from your, your, your enjoying your grandmother's cooking to a world-known right. chef, which is actually what you are. Right, right. Um, I got a chance to, I got a chance to be around the right people at the right time. I got a chance mm -hmm. to um, get some different breaks. Uh, I got a chance to be blessed and uh, connected with many different people. Uh, you know, I went to culinary school years ago, or, or in school Atlanta. Uh, and spent a couple years there. Went on to Ruth Chris Steakhouse, cooked there. Tom Tom's in the mall in Atlanta, cooked there. Both places at the same time. Not at the same time, but you know, both places employed. Uh, and so both places were very, very humble and busy back in the 90s. You know, Tom Tom's, I'm sure you, I think you remember Tom Tom's in Atlanta Mall, Buckhead, and also Ruth Chris. Uh, there by the J.W. Marriott, uh, very, very busy places. Uh, and I began to connect with the right different, right people, you know. Come in, came out to Chattanooga, cooked with a lot of different chefs, uh, got around some different people, uh, 
two different hotels in the city. Uh, and then I began to connect with not just in Chattanooga, but in Atlanta, Florida, with a lot of different celebrities. Uh, now, how, how did that, you skipped it. You you <laughs> skipped the spot there. <laughs> You've gone from cooking in Chattanooga to celebrities in Atlanta. Yeah. Celebrities everywhere. Celebrities everywhere. How, how did that How did that happen? Uh, got a chance to. Uh, now nothing's by chance. You had to have done something. Uh, I would say. Chance, fate. Chance, chance, what, 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 chance. You know. Well, maybe skill. Maybe you're good at what you do. Well, skill well, definitely well, has to yeah. Well, 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 skill. Something to do with it, most definitely. Yeah, most definitely. Skill will, skill will bring the uh, eyes and you know, you know, to hey, this chef does what he does. Hey, let's try him. Someone okay. wise once said, "Opportunity. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Good luck is when preparation meets opportunity." So that he he's got the skills. He got a break, he delivered, which spread the word that, hey, my man delivers. Luck favors the prepared. Right. Yes. Boom. Right. I like yeah, that one, that's too. that's it. I like that one. Yeah, luck favors <laughs> the prepared, you know? Right. In other words, it's not luck. It's not, it's not luck. It's just taking... It's just being ready to receive the luck. Whenever the opportunity right. comes knocking, right. boom. So how did that happen? Um, it happened by me coming in contact with some entertainers in the hotel, entertainers coming to different venues, uh, me, uh, a person connecting with me and telling me, hey, I got this person coming, I want you to do something for them, you know. Uh, oh, man, see right, right here, you know. Hey, <laughs> it, look, it, the entertainer rapper. Yeah, it, how did he it, come it, into it, this it, picture? It, so look, we met, yeah. a young dog. We you met, know, we met know. around 20, <laughs> around 2010. 2009. Uh, earlier, earlier than that. We, we, and, uh, You're both from Chattanooga, right? Uh-huh. And so we just happened to run into each other, and uh, I'm, I'm always networking, and he was like, I'm a chef, uh, you know, I'm, I'm classically trained. I worked, I've worked here, here, and here. I've worked with this, this, and this celebrity. And, uh, now, what I, was you doing at the time? I was uh, making my own art uh, and entertainment. I'm a, I'm a hip-hop artist, and I was putting together uh, shows uh, in conjunction with different venues. Now, do you, do you sing, or do you, do you promote? I, yeah, I would say I don't wouldn't say I sing. I rap. I perform. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna <laughs> dis, disrespect the singers who can really blow out here. I, I rap and perform. I songwrite and produce. Uh, and uh, so I become a event organizer because it was as an up and coming artist. It was hard to get on as an opener or or you know to get gigs. So I said, hey, why don't we rent out the venues and promote the shows ourselves, get people to come, and that's how we'll pay ourselves. We right. did we did that, started getting notoriety for not only being good artists, but having great events. And uh, I met up with, with Chef, just happenstance, uh, and he was like, I do this, this, and this. And so uh, when I had some uh, headlining entertainers come, I was like, yo, you need to be the chef, uh, cook, cook for them, you know, it makes everybody look good. Everybody get paid. In cycling, we'd say you're drafting. You dra we're drafting, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. And so we had a we had a uh, opportunity to uh, cook for people like uh, Young Dolph, uh, Memphis Memphis artist, uh, well, Grammy nominated uh, a Memphis well, rapper. Um, uh, who else? A schoolie of. Uh, of uh so you promote and he feeds <laughs> sometimes <laughs> yeah. yeah sometimes no with caters Cater. that's how we put caters yes yeah. <laughs> who's the one of the most famous people you've dealt you've been working with uh one of the most famous people i've worked with i i probably would i'd say we, i was blessed in the early 2000s to do a show alongside uh killer mike i got to open up he probably wouldn't even remember but i got to open up for him in chattanooga and uh this was come right off him coming off of winning a grammy with outcast for the the whole world and uh not only is he a great rap artist but he's a, a community organizer and uh speaking out for uh uh, social justice and equality when it comes to wealth building and education. 
So I really looked up to him. You know, he's a Grammy nominated dude with, with the, from out with the Outcast song, and I got to open up for him back uh, at, at 232 uh, downtown Chattanooga back in the day in the mid 2000s. And so, so that was probably uh, my most famous artist I got to work with like directly. Uh, and shout out uh, Bankroll Fresh out of Atlanta. Um, he was one of the biggest rappers before he was assassinated in Atlanta, and he was. We got to work with him on several different projects, and that was an honor. Uh, Kwani Cash out of Atlanta, uh, working with uh, GME Studios in Atlanta was was great. Um, I've been on I've been on different cards with a a, a lot of headlining acts, but I don't, I really wouldn't call that working directly with them, you know. If if I I get to be the opener to a to a to a headliner, I think that's just more drafting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but doing music and doing art and being able to uh, stream an income from what I love has been super duper awesome. You say art? What do you mean? Art, making music. Music is art. Yeah, and performing performing is art. Getting getting rocking the stage and retaining people's attention and having them bop with you. It's art, you know. But nowadays, you they don't buy the records like used to. We'd go buy the records. Listen, I mean, streaming. If you're streaming enough, it's still it's still buying the record. It's just these days, with streaming, you kind of like used to. We had to go in the record store, buy the record, and that's it. If it was whack, it's still yours. If if it's great, you you bought an amazing album. But now, you know, you can you can. You essentially pay a streaming platform to have access to all your favorite stuff and then try out the new stuff. And if it's whack, so be it. I tried it out. It was whack. If it's amazing, I, I have access to listen to it for, for forever as long as I pay my subscription, you know what I'm saying? So well, essentially, we still kind of buy the records. What do you think the future is to, to buying records? Um, I, mean, I think... Is it, is it going to be... What's going to happen? It, I, it's... It's gonna be forever evolving. It's streaming is gonna be always, in, in, always in, in forty up. in forty fifty years. Streaming is gonna be it's gonna be something else, and but but people are always gonna want new tunes. Are there a thousand people out there that could entertain a group of people, but they just don't have the promotions? Yeah, I would say it's a million people. That, I mean, there's a thousand people that sing in the shower every morning that say, "Man, if if you could get that out to people," but nobody's going to get it out to. Them. I would say it's a more so than that. I mean, even more realistically, I'd say it's dozens of thousands of musicians, artists, singers who are on a who can who can't get out of the back alley bar or the karaoke night that are amazing. or out of the shower or, or that are amazing, but that were really are actively like making art and pursuing you know putting on the forefront that if they had the machine of a record company or a promoter they would be out of here you remember you ever watched the beverly hillbillies oh well, yeah. yeah remember when uh when jethro bodine's cousin got off the train and they were trying to promote him as a as an artist yeah, yeah and yeah. they they sewed the hats and he really couldn't even sing uh -huh. but they it's almost like you need that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So to speak. In that in that field. Well, a lot of times, a lot of times, the artist can necessarily not make amazing art, but sell their self, their personality, or their charisma, or their story. Their, their you know enthusiasm. I mean? Yeah. But if you get somebody <laughs> to come on stage and they can sing "Amazing Grace" better than anybody else. You're not going to sell two albums. You have to have the person that does something different to an audience. Right. Right. And I don't know exactly what that is. You, you might sell a couple albums, but what people want is something that's speaking to them, speaking to the times. Like, like you take all like yeah. trending. What's, what's the, what's the trending? Joint, yeah. What's the joint Amer American Idol? Like a yeah. lot of them could could uh, blow, but the ones that were successful, Kelly Clarkson, Fantasia, some others, they they got, they took their talent and then got it packaged up, got some songwriters behind them, and then pushed them to the next level. Right. It, it, yeah, it takes, 
I think it takes uniqueness. When it comes to entertainment, people don't just want the the talent. The status quo, yeah. They want they want they want the person as well. They want <laughs> they want uh, the story. They want to be engaged with with the other stuff. But you take uh, like for instance, back in 1929. I know I brought up Hank Williams Jr., but just just because it's on my mind. Uh-huh. You know, Hank Williams Sr. came out during the Depression. Mm-hmm. My understanding is that he had he sold more records per comparison than Michael Jackson did. I don't know if that's true, but I do know so that, like, like, and he couldn't sing, he couldn't carry a tune. What made him attractive to people? It was like what he was talking about, you know, that was very important. He was talking to the people and, and how he was doing it. You know, he was like the everyday dude. I could be, I could, I could be Hank Williams Jr. You know, I think that's the same thing today was appealing uh, with, like, the pop stars or the rappers. You know, that could be the guy from around the corner. Uh, he, he resonated with the, with the people. And um, I, think, I think what you say is important, too. Right. You know, you go back, you know, you talk about the Ying Yang twins. I know you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're, you're connected Shout with them somewhat. Yeah. Right, right. You remember that, that song they had that said... Uh, um, the they're they're not listening to the preachers or the teachers, but it's the rappers. Mm-hmm. What's that song? Uh, I can't remember the name of the song. It, uh, it's on. It's on. Uh, their first. There's a fine little woman. Uh, <laughs> what's the name of the song? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about, though. I can't think of the name. I got that'll drive me crazy. I can't think of Y'all gotta uh, get a fact checker to uh, uh, be googling um, that shit up. <laughs> Google. But they're not listening. They're, they're not. They're not listening to the teachers or the preachers. They're listening to the rappers. Most definitely. Where was I going with that? I don't know. I can't remember. I was off, uh, but what I, I think what I was saying was, why did Hank Williams Sr. make such a big splash and he couldn't even sing? He was like he was like he was like a rapper back in the day. That's all he was. Yeah, he was. You he know, was speaking to the times. He was speaking to the times. And he resonated with people. When you, when people you got, recognized it was, his character. It was a novelty, man. It's a novelty. Now, yes. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Just like many, many artists. Uh, <clears throat> and they have, to, now do those people have to have promotions or do they just rise or do they just hang on with the white knuckles till they get there? Uh, some, a lot of, a lot of people have been able just to rise and, and, and cause a buzz. Um, if you can get, if you can get your city and your state engaged and, uh, have it spread out, you know, back, I'm, uh, Back in the day, it was much harder. Uh, word of mouth was the thing, but but now with with internet and social media, you know uh, you have somebody that's causing a buzz in, in a secluded area. You can get out there, YouTube, um, Instagram, Facebook, all of that. You know, so now it's readily available. They're like, this is amazing, and you get you get enough hundred people saying it's amazing. If you can get if you can get a thousand people to spread it to ten people, you know, and then to spread it to two people, you know, it's boom. It's next thing there. you know, you're viral, and then next, next <coughs> thing you know, you got somebody that's gonna try to help you help them, or vice versa, or whatever, you know. You, you know, your views are ten thousand, fifty thousand, a so, hundred fifty thousand. Social media <laughs> currency. Speaking of that, you you've got my understanding is you've got like. Forty thousand followers. Thousands of views. Thousands of views. Yes. How do you accomplish that? Uh, I mean, I, I've been I've been <laughs> doing this for six months, and I've got a thousand followers, and one of them's me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one that I know I mean, is. You, you, how did you get? I, we haven't quite. You haven't quite convinced me how you got to where you're at. Um, what happened? I got 
to where I'm at. Are you all. just good at what you do? I'm good at what I do, humbly speaking. And I'm always going to say that because that's important, humbly speaking. I'm good at what I do by skill, by having knowledge about food, by having creativity, uh, knowing what people like, uh, you know, being able to be trendy, being able to be different and being able to pretty much uh, deliver what people want and what they don't want, you know, listen to that and, uh, you know, adapt to changes, you know. Of course, you can't give any, anyone anything that's, uh, that they have a allergies and things like that, you know, that's, that's a no-no. But you want to be able to be a chef for everybody, you know. You want to be, a, you know, I'm a chef for everybody, you know. And, you know, so through hard work, through effort, through trial and error, trial and error is important. You know, you make mistakes, you know, you mess up, you know, you learn. Uh, you know, you begin to evolve and, you know, you begin to evolve and around and you begin to change, you begin to open up to everything. And I got a chance to be really experienced with what I'm doing by many, many years of doing it, trial and error. And, be, and become successful by the right breaks and the right opportunities. Uh, even if you are not successful this month, does not mean that you're not successful at all. This means you might have had a bad month. You know, you might have had a bad day today. Don't mean the next six days of the week are going to be bad. You know, success is within. Success is from how you look at it. You know, not from someone else's perspective. Even though someone may judge you and say, hey, you are this and you are that, it's how you feel about yourself and you believe in the success within yourself, you know. It gives me the ability to be able to do what I do. You know, I can connect with young Dolph. I appreciate and thank God for the opportunity to be able to chef and cook for him. And, you know, vanilla Ice, I have cooked for him many different times. Uh, I had an opportunity to cook with Gene Simmons on more than two occasions. What he? Uh, man, Gene Simmons is a steak eater. He's a steak guy. Steak and potatoes, yes. <laughs> and that's very uh, he's, Gene Simmons is a good guy. Uh, uh, got a chance to cook for many different people. Mary, Mario Lopez, uh, local artists here, doctors, lawyers. Like Lady that. Gaga? Not Lady Gaga yet. Well, I wish I did. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, Ryan She's probably, was she vegan? She's Would probably. you cook for her? I would definitely cook for Lady Gaga. Just, <laughs> just, Lady Gaga is one of my favorites. Just to have a conversation, just to be like, what up? Let's, let's yeah. rap. Let's <laughs> talk about some shit. Lady, Lady Gaga. Do they call you? How does this happen? Uh, it happens through connections. One person knowing another person. So you cook me. for them one time or a cater for them? Or how does that work? Several different times. Because when, when I contacted you, you were actually in Hollywood. Yeah, I California. Was, right, I was in I was in California. I was in Cleveland, Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spent a lot of time in Yeah, I try to spend a lot of time in LA. Uh LA is uh I'm not gonna say I call it home, I'm gonna say I call it connection. Um sometimes you can be around certain areas and certain people and things uh you know, they touch you. Uh you know, and I'm gonna say this, uh, Hollywood is an area where anybody can go and hope that they become a star. Not that you go to Hollywood because you want to be a star. A lot of, some people do, as a matter of fact, a lot of people do. I'm not one to really go to Hollywood or LA just to want to be a star. But if it connects with you, whether you're in LA, in the area of people and, and, and just opportunities connect with you. Are you in New York? If that's you, so be it. You know, it, neither one of those places might not be you, LA or New York. Might be Nashville. Maybe, look, maybe, look, maybe someplace. But, but, um, whatever, look, what, look, whatever it may be, look, whatever it may be, um, what, look, whatever it may be, um, it's got to be able to connect with you somehow. So I know how it worked with uh, some of some of my artists. Um, they like they like have in their in their rider what what they want for. Uh, 
What they want, what they, they, <laughs> they like request. Uh, Are you from Chattanooga? I'm from Chattanooga. What part of East Chattanooga? Where is that, East Chattanooga? East Chattanooga, uh, Glass Street area, Avondale area. Uh, close to Fort Oglethorpe? Close to Fort Oglethorpe, close to uh, Highway 58. Close to... Uh, 58? Highway 58? The airport? No, other side, other side of town. Oh. Like, uh, down by the riverside. Where you take your burdens. 191 <laughs> Chester. <laughs> 191 Chester. You know where you take your burdens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, not that, not that close to the river. Ross Landing. Ross Landing. Mm, the other side of riverside. And the cooler side. And the cooler oh. side. Highway. I built Dr. Banks' office on Shalford Road. Okay. On, yeah, on, yeah, yeah, like last yeah. Year, yeah. year or so ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I just hate working in Chattanooga. It's so complicated. Yeah. Those, Rules, those regulations, yeah. wait on this. You small, have to have, small, a, small you have, to have a liaison to get a building permit. Mm -hmm. I can't go apply. I had to get this guy mm -hmm. to be a liaison to get me the permit. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the way. How about the Mayor Kelly? New, new, new mayor. Is this new mayor? Yeah. New mayor Tim Kelly. My, Tim Kelly. Yeah. Mr. Tim Kelly. I don't know him. I had him on my podcast. He's all right. Yeah. He's all right, dude. Was he a? Who is the other guy? He's real tall, right? Burke. Uh, Burke. He's yeah. a Andy Burke. So he lost. No, no he no, was. He, he was a him. lame duck. What does that mean? That means it was his last term. Okay. So he can't run it ahead of a term? Mm -hmm. I, I actually did He turned out. I actually did personally. Was he a good guy? I mean, I just think he was a good guy. You know, you know, people had their differences of opinion. Uh, you know, my opinion may be different from someone else on my level, right? You know, I, I, I actually knew him when he was a, you know, a thin, <laughs> the thin guy going to, going to college, and he wasn't even thinking about being old. Mayor at the time. Now I work for a landscape company. I actually worked for a landscape company many, many years ago, and we did grass and landscaping and stuff. And uh, I did grass for his mom and maintenance for his mom and stuff. The landscape company I worked for. And at the very end of the cul de sac down, he lived in the house down at the end of the cul de sac. You know, and he was just a regular guy. Yeah, a regular guy. You know, like I said, you know, I. He would, I wouldn't say that he's just a regular guy. His well, well, parents was like well, lawyers who own lots and lots right. of yeah, property. That's different. That's different. Well, right. I mean, he's not a regular guy, but it just, you know, uh, he was going to college, going to school, uh, educating himself. And like I said, you know, I, I met him then. You know, I would go to his mom's house, do the grass, do the lawn, doing the pesticide spray and stuff. And that's, you know, that's what, what I'm about to say is the pesticide spray. Anyway, I did that for his families, the house, and I would go down, we would all get done and then go down to his, go, look, go, look, look, go down, go down to his um, uh, house at the very end of the cold say and I got a chance to meet him, and he was a cool guy, but, uh, you know, I think now, you know, when I look at, when I look now at the whole years past versus then, I would have never thought that he would have became a mayor, but he did. You know, he did a great job. job. He did a great job. But uh, it's interesting you say that because uh, that was one of the things that uh, Kelly talked about in his campaign is about code enforcement and all that stuff. And what was he saying about it? Make it you see, basically making it simpler. simpler. So I, so I wasn't. In other words, the problem I was having wasn't an unusual problem. That no. was a real problem. It wasn't it's just a, me. No, it's a, it's a real problem. Uh, code enforcement, dealing the, t the time it takes after you, to get a permit to build or remodel or whatever, and then the... I always felt like when I was getting a permit there, I was I was asking for a real favor. Yeah. That's and like, they, that's, were, they were they were going to do me a favor. <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to down yeah. my city. I love my city, but, you know, it's, uh, it is like that. You know, it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Can I curse? Sure, it's on the internet. It's like the fucking mafia sometimes. Yeah. It's like you got to come and kiss the ring. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah.
Yeah. The mafia would be easier on you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You just pay them and, and do the paperwork yeah, and they'd be like, do your yeah. thing. <laughs> right, 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 right. Do you think, uh, what about the uh, river bend? Is it coming up? Uh, actually, uh, I mean, it's actually, coming back, I'm, but they I'm say, the river bend. They say uh, it's not going to be a... Uh, it's not going to be uh, the Friends of the Festival anymore. It's going to be a different organizing. I, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Uh, I mean, you know, it's been mid for a couple years anyway. You know, it's been some decent acts here and there. I wish they would mess with local artists a little bit more. Um, have them open up for some. You know, that would be good. That would be awesome. You know, last year they had, what, Poison there? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, well, year before last. They didn't do it. Last yeah, year before COVID. Let me tell you a funny story. This is a true story. So I get to go to these people's house, uh -huh. condo, Chestnut Avenue. Okay. And I go over there. We had never been there before. So my wife was with me. And so we go to the balcony, overlooking right. where poison is. The stage is literally right, right there. Right. And I said... I'll be right back. I'm going to go to the bathroom. Well, so I go through the house, through the halls, go to the bathroom. They had one of those sliding doors. Mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't get it unlocked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, we're a little bit embarrassed. So I'm calling her and saying, hey, I'm stuck in this bathroom. And she didn't know where I was at because she didn't know the place either. So she said, well, where are you? And I said, well, you go down the hall. <laughs> so I finally got her down to where I was I was at. And so we're a little bit embarrassed, you know, because we're in the, I think I was in the master bedroom, bathroom, at these people's house that we didn't know all that well. Yeah. I didn't know anybody there except the owners of the house. Okay. So I, So she's trying to get me out of the bathroom, of course, I can't tell her nothing because we're talking on the phone. So finally, one of the relatives came by and saw us and said, what are y'all doing? She said, well, I'm trying to get my husband <laughs> out of the bathroom. <laughs> so a few minutes later, the owner comes around. He's trying to get me out of the bathroom. They have to call the superintendent of the building. He comes out. They're filming trying to get me out of this pocket door that has... Now, I'm in the construction, but if I was on the other side, I could have probably done it. But I was on the inside without any tools. <laughs> so they finally get me out. We're all embarrassed. And I walk back out to the balcony, and he said, thank you for coming. <laughs> I didn't even get to see the show. None of it. None of it. Damn. None of it. Stuck in the bathroom. Stuck in the bathroom. That's a true story. Yeah, yeah. So, what's next for Chef Reginald Dwight? What's next for yeah. me? What's next for my brand? Um, Is cycling a byproduct? Uh, I mean, if you don't yeah. become a great cyclist, you're not going to make any money at that anyway, right? Uh, you can, actually. But probably not, right? No, I, well, I'm not going to say probably. I'm going for the gusto. I'm going for the goal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, you know, you know, I mean, being a chef is more, you know, would be more lucrative, lucrative you know, if you... Do you, uh, do you say, go you know, out and, from, from and, real, real and do you have a staff with you or just you? Uh, no, I don't just have, I don't, not just me. I got a staff with me, you know. I got people that work for me as well, you know. Uh, Ten people or five? Less and less than that. Uh, but... Uh, it depends on the job. If we need to get some extra people for a bigger job. You can't. Yeah, we can't. We got people in the industry that, that we trust and have, have skills. In other words, he's the brains. Right, 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 right. Uh, you know, there's people that uh, are in many different areas that chefs just like myself that I get to uh, fill in, you know, fulfill jobs that are called for certain things, you know, and uh, that way that they are. You know, adequately done, you know, uh, no matter where they are. Uh, what's next for me and my brand um, is more pod, uh, podcasts, of course, cooking shows, uh, those two, uh, development on one end of the podcast, cooking show, uh, aside from that, development, of course, 
Also, my book that, that I'll be working on, which is very, very, I'm glad you said that what you did was next because the book that I have planned to write also will be accompanied by a book series. And it will be super, super great. You know, it's, it's going to be it's going to be wonderful. It's something I've been working on for the past two, three years. Like. If I may, the uh, the first no. book is going to be introspective of the journey of Chef Reginald. Uh, it's going to, you know, like what we were talking about today, the, the inspirations, the influences, and, and it's, it'll be a deeper detailed into like the journey of, you know, some of the stuff that was happening until to this point. And uh, the, the, what's really going to be cool for Chef Reg, I didn't know if he was going to get to this. So my bad if I cut you off, but the, the vlog is going to be really cool. Um, more content and more uh, video of the cool stuff that he that he makes and specializes in. Right. And, of course, you know, the title of the book uh, I can give to you right now is be awesome. You know, that way you know it. And, it, like I said, it'll be coming in by... Uh, and ain't connected with that book itself. Well, give me the title. Give me the title. Give me the title. Uh, the name of the title of the book <laughs> will be "Don't Give a Damn, Just Cook This." And people, people will look like, man. What, what, what? Explain that title. The name. Of, the reason why that title is, in life, sometimes you just got to go beyond the limits. Sometimes you just got to just do what you do. Sometimes it's got to be a no holds bar. Sometimes when you have limits and limitations on your life and things, you just got to go above and beyond that. And the name of that book being Don't Give a Damn, Just Cook, this means that I'm going beyond what everyone else has set out for me to do and the limitations and stuff that they put on you and all this and that. And that for you to rise above all that. And just when you cook this means you put all yourself into that and just do it. And that you rise, look, you rise above the status quo. You rise above the middle level. You go to the top. I'm am sensing that your book is not the message is not about cooking. Is is it paralleling something else? Yes, it is actually. It's paralleling. It's, it's paralleling the passion of being high. Going above status quo, being successful, uh, no holds bar, no limitations, persevering, all of that, perseverance, everything. Are you, you parallel? Know, blood, 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 sweat, and tears. All the blood, sweat, and tears I've been that I put into being a chef through the years. Uh, I'm putting that into the book, and that book in itself lets people know through life struggles, trials, and errors, and everything where I am, where I want to go, where I want them to be and the encouragement I give them in the book. So with that book itself will be connected with resource managers as well. Like, you know, uh, know how to cook certain foods, know how to cook pastas and seafoods and things like that. You know, kind of, kind of so to speak, like a, you know, when you go into Barnes & Noble, you go to the section of books and it, you know, you know that section of books in the Barnes & Noble that's called Dummies? Mm -hmm. Or idiots. Yeah. Okay. Well, those books, if you look at those, they have certain sections of, I mean, I'm sorry, they have certain subjects in those books that pertain to people not actually really knowing anything about certain things. And it's kind of like a, an instructional manual. It's kind of like a uh, to-do. Uh, gives you instruction on how this and how that. Well, those resource manuals will be connected to that book in itself as helping folks uh, knowing how to cook dishes, cook seafood, cook meats, cook uh, pastas, and know how to bake, and not have no limitations on themselves. Just do it. Just, just, just be successful at cooking. Be successful at knowing how to make dishes and meats or or whatever it is you or do. Whatever it is, whatever it is I do. Whatever it is you do. Right. Because, see, in life, you know, when you go about doing something, sometimes people have tendencies to not pull the, put them full selves into it. And whether it be chefing, whether it be cooking, 
whether it be you being a banker, a lawyer, a doctor, whatever it is, just put your whole self into it. Have, have, have enthusiasm about what you're doing. There's a lot of people right now that do not uh, have what they should have because of sometimes, not just about the lack of opportunity, but even when they get the opportunity, they, it's got to also be about here too as well. You got to know that even beyond, you know, the no's and the you can't do this and you can't do that or, hey, we don't have the opportunity right now. If we're not hiring right now, this or that, you're going to make it by how you think and how you perceive where you want to be and how you look at the situation and know that your success is not about someone else, it's about yourself. A lot of people's success sometimes is deterred because of how they think and how they you know, derail themselves. You can derail yourself to the left or the right you know, and not be successful. If I did, if I detail, you know, if I derail myself to the left or the right, and go down the wrong track, I won't finish. You know, I won't complete. I won't be a successful chef. I won't be a successful cyclist. I won't get one of these. You know, that's a finishing. So, again, going back to cooking, you can be successful chef. You can be a successful. Cyclist, you can be as successful whatever you want to be, depending on how you think. Mm. Don't derail yourself to the left or the right at all. Because if you do derail yourself to the left or the right, if you just stay in one position and not go forward, but in all actuality, if you actually don't go forward, you're going somewhere. You're going to burn. And you're going nowhere. I mean, you, you're going you, to burn the chicken. Right, right. Yeah, you're going to burn chicken. <laughs> exactly. If you actually, or if you cook like it. Like feathering in, the brakes. Right, 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 right. If you got, exactly, if you got chicken cooking in a cast iron skillet and you don't turn it over, then it's going to burn on the one side. That's right. What that means is that if you do not take the opportunity to take the next step forward and do something else that's necessary for that product to be successful, means there has to be a balance there in cooking. That means you can't just cook it all hard on all on one side and expect it to be good because it won't because the other side will be raw, one side will be dark. Well, same thing in life. If you expect to be successful, you can't just think that if you don't do what it takes to uh, be successful and go forward, then you're going to be successful. One is you can't allow yourself to be derailed to the left or the right. You can't just stay where you are you got to go forward. you got to be successful. you got to believe that, hey, you can do it. When people tell you, no, you cannot do it. you got to have some enthusiasm, you know, and be who you're going to be. I think that's what your grandmother was teaching you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I've been through a lot as a person for many years. Uh, you know, you and, see the connection. Yeah, yeah. I Most mean, definitely. Yeah, I mean, Most through, definitely. through the many years. Uh, I was telling you earlier about the pesticide springs. You know, I did that for a landscape company. And, you know, bad to say, you know, I got, you know, my jaw right here got infected by spraying pesticides. So I lost half my tea palate because it, was, it became cancerous. And I had a great, I had a great doctor. And I thank God for this doctor. Me and him are friends to this day. And I'm, I know you know this guy, Dr. Larry Sargent, craniofacial doctor. You know, when I first met him, saw him, hey, I, I thought, hey, I thought I wanted another doctor, somebody that I knew, not the, not the Fox or someone, another doctor here, and here. You know, they were in the same organization in the medical field. I, you know, I saw this doctor coming out the back. I was like, man, you know, hey, and I don't want that guy. Hey, now come on. But let me tell you, what I did not know was, God was blessing me that that was the best person for you. That was the best in the world. Mm. One of the best doctors in the world. So he did what he had to do to perform the surgery to cause my bad situation to turn about, to not become, but not stay cancerous. Uh, I got better. I didn't like the fact that I lost having my teeth out there. You know, it, it bothered me for many, many years because of what happened. Uh, but I had, to I had to persevere through that. You know, it caused me to think differently and 
by myself and how it's caused me to, you know, not be so outspoken, caused me to not be so uh, full of uh, full of joy, caused me to not be so uh, uh, full of energy and livelihood, uh, you know, when I was around people. But I learned to, I learned through the hard times of that, and I got past that. And then I began to gain life, life within myself, you know, uh, encouragement from others, people that don't care, hey, how you look or something going on with you, something like, hey, you know, you really don't know this person. You know, you have, you know, I almost died. I almost died years ago, back in like 98, 99. I almost died from having this issue and situation, you know, tumor in my jaw. But I got past that. And so I began to build up strength and energy. God bless me. I got enthusiasm. I got encouragement from others. And I began to, you know, I began to cook. You know, I never ever stopped cooking. Even though I went through a lot, what I did, I went through a lot of issues and situations, you know, but I never stopped ever cooking. I never ever stopped cooking and doing what I did. So I began to continue to cook. I began to, uh, you know, do more events, do more shows, you know, you know, from the means of catering for them and cooking for these guys. Uh, I began to feel more encouraged inside. I began to build, you know, get more built up. And so my enthusiasm became more. So, you know, I found that, I found that people that I was around with my real friends, you know, people that really love me and care for me, didn't care about none of that extra stuff. And that's what life showed me, even through the ups and downs, that there are people that were there for me that really cared for me. See, Grime, this man right great entertainer, person, really cared. You know, a lot of other people that I know really cared and were there for me. And I began to get past all that. And I began to uh, encourage others. And even in myself now, you know, a lot of times when I talk, I speak, I, I even forget about my situation. You know what I'm saying? And I have my teeth out and gone. But guess what? I thank God for being able to talk. I thank God for being able to reach others and touch others with the ability to be able to cook and chef uh, and touch lives because my chefing and my cooking, I feel, is touching lives and touching people. I feel that there's a, there's a, there's importance with that, and I do it. I, I do it because it's necessary. And, uh, you know, I try to touch lives with my food and touch others, and I feel that it has done. You know, regardless of what I believe I'm you're doing. doing what your grandmother was doing. Right. You know, and uh, she just didn't have a camera. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, exactly. I, you know, I try. You know, I try to get goals and and plaques and everything I do. You know, whether it might be a plaque for. I got to go like, uh, well, you're staying positive. You're moving forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not going to do something that gets us extra points on the pinball machine that gives us 12 more years of extended play anyway. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So do what you love today. Right. Because YOLO. You never know when your last day may be. You do you think God has a plan gone. for all this? Yes, I do. I definitely do. Do you believe that? Most definitely. It's us. It was written before us and, you know, we just playing our part in the destiny. Doing the best we can with what we can. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and this might be weird, but when I get introspective, I, I just look at, you know, us. We just the big ass ant farm, you know, and we out here milling about, building and creating and taking care of our our species, like, like the ant farm does. You know, we're just doing it on a on a bigger scale. And it really doesn't matter. It it it, it matters a little bit because. What you do will determine if you leave a positive or a negative effect on, on the world, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, right. with your carbon footprint, with your legacy on how you treated people, uh, with, the, with the resources that you brought to the earth, all of that, it, it matters. To me, I don't know, to me. Things happen at the right time. Also, things may, some things may happen at the wrong time. 
you're not a chef. To me, you're an inspiration. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I try to be. I try to be. Thanks for having us, man. Thanks so much.